Oh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're having an adequate day. Ah, uh, my dog apparently isn't. Anyways, uh, I hope that uh, you are coming along with homework and that the rest of your midterm treat season is treating you uh, all right. I am, uh, you know, like you, looking forward to reading break a scant 10 days away and reeling with the constant change in the nature of our existence. Uh, so... Uh, if you have any questions, uh, post them in chat or uh, the Discord. I've got my eyes on both. Um, anything before we get going? All right. So when last we spoke, I kind of closed out uh, by showing you a movie from The Silk Project, which was displaying the, which was simulating something about the lifetimes of clouds or whatever. Uh, it's an amazing uh, set of numerical simulations that's kind of tracking a box of the interstellar medium and, you know, all the physics that interplays uh, within it. And so I kind of wanted to come back today and show you a little bit of that uh, box. Um, let me. I got. I wanna. There we are. You don't need as much of me as you need a temperature scale. Got to get my whole PDF visible. That's better. Uh, yeah. So this is that one of those simulations from the Silk Group, and what it is showing you is kind of two components of the ISM. Uh, we have on the, uh, let's see here, the left-hand side here, uh, this bit over here, that's showing you the number density for a slice of the ISM uh, in the galaxy. My goodness, this is just not the right day. Yeah. Sorry, I, my crops are aggressive this time so i want to make sure you see uh, the whole thing and there it is behold the interstellar medium so i want you to be able to see that this is a 500 by 500 parsec uh box and the way it is is this actually a three-dimensional volume that you're seeing and what i'm showing you is essentially a simulation through the uh, a slice through the simulation domain here and on uh, the bottom is kind of the x and y axis and this is oriented so that this is in the plane of the galaxy and then uh, what you see here is that there is this dense uh, cloud here and notice this is the logarithmic scale in terms of particle number density so it goes from a billion at the top to one so it doesn't look like there's a lot of change that's going on through this axis but in reality is this spanning you know this is six seven orders of magnitude in the range of data that you see here so it looks a little bit more gray but that only means a million times more dense uh, on the right hand side here what you're seeing is a temperature scale and again this is running over a factor of a hundred thousand in temperature where you have cold material here that has temperatures of about 10 to 100 kelvin and you get really hot material up here which has temperatures of a million to ten million Kelvin. And you'll notice that these two images look almost the same structurally. And the high, high temperature stuff is very low density and the high density stuff is low temperature. Uh, such that if I multiplied these two images together, I'd get a constant value that would come out at around 10 to the eighth or so, uh, which is essentially the representation of the pressure. Uh, in the uh, interstellar medium. So what's neat about this is you can see there are these big holes. You see this nice round structure here. That is a recent supernova explosion that went off. And when we watched it, this in the animated setup uh, on uh, Monday, I guess, you could see little flashes of supernova going off in different places. This is catching one uh, right here in the act uh, when I made this image. So this is the same volume of this it's a three-dimensional volume but here we're making a slice through it uh in the direction of you know sort of vertically through the plane of the galaxy so now if i sort of think about the galaxy as looking like this 
uh, what the simulation volume is doing is it's kind of taking a slice of the galaxy like this. So this section here represents the midplane of the galaxy. And you'll notice that most of the material is concentrated in that. And then these hot bubbles are erupting up out of the plane of the galaxy and kind of blasting material out from these supernova explosions, eroding away at these cold molecular clouds that are sitting around in the midplane. Um, and uh, I just want to call your attention to, again, big bright supernova explosion hanging out up top. And uh, if you, I don't know if this comes across on Zoom at all, but if it does, uh, you can sort of maybe like go in here. You'll notice that in the midplane, a beautiful high resolution image, this stuff down here, doesn't look like much at all like it sort of looks like oh i'm waiting for the video to catch up and if that's coming through at all uh what that is actually how they do the numerical simulation and the uh the, what the numerical simulation is showing you is that you actually do less resolution uh down there at the um uh, sort of far away from the midplane, and that just saves on computational expense in carrying out this uh, study of the galaxy. Um, hmm. All right, so yeah, let me readjust my crop there. And I just wanted to show you that uh, because it gives you a, it's a really pretty good perspective on what the interstellar medium of the galaxy uh, really looks like. It's a uh, it's a mess. It really is a bit of a mess. So you might wonder how the heck are we going to make any progress at all describing these particular uh, uh, situations. And we're not going to do a full and complete treatment. You can come back in grad school and I'll be happy to drag you through my grad level course on the interstellar medium with joy. I, I found my notes in preparing for these lectures and so I was going through them like, yeah, this is a lot of physics. Um, but the, what I want to do is kind of go through this in three separate uh, case studies that highlight some features of the interstellar medium. And the things that I like to think about at the ISM are that uh, they're kind of some philosophical points that matter for the purposes of understanding galaxies. So for the first thing is that you should understand that the ISM is dynamic. And whenever I sit down, and I will in the next slide, say, okay, let's assume a steady state. Uh, that's a bit of a lie. That is uh, a spherical cow. We'll do a spherical cow too. Uh, but the, you know, it's a spherical, it, it, it's a steady state lie. And the time variations in the interstellar medium can't be neglected. For a star, you can, for example, neglect how fast it's contracting or changing sizes to understand it because it's in a very, it's in a uh, evolutionarily equilibrium over the nuclear evolutionary time scales of the star. Billions of years. So you don't have to worry about it collapsing on 30 seconds. The interstellar medium is not that regime. In the interstellar medium, what you're getting is you get essentially the dynamical time scales, which is the time scales it takes for matter to move across a system, are comparable to all the other evolutionary time scales uh, in the system. Uh, and so what that means is that the, uh, yeah, the, uh, is comparable to the evolutionary timescales in the system. So uh, this means that the physics of uh, this is playing out and we have to pay attention to how time variations are coming into it. Uh, the second thing I alluded to earlier, which is if I multiply those densities and temperatures together, I get roughly a constant product. Uh, and that rough constant product is a statement that we refer to as equipartition. And equipartition means that the energy in the system is kind of equally divided. And if you work that out, you see that the energy density in the different phases of the interstellar medium are all at a roughly equal level. And this leads to a balance of energy and momentum transfer through the phases. So not in steady state, but there is a bit of a balance. And so there's a push and a pull that leads to a galaxy being in roughly an equivalent state over time, even though any given chunk of the galaxy is changing dramatically.
And then finally, the reason why we really care about the ISM is that it functions as an exchange. And I like this analogy as VIT being kind of like a crossroads for matter and energy as it flows through the galaxy. If materials are creating in from the intergalactic medium and building up the mass of a galaxy, it comes through the ISM first, then we get uh, channeled through the star formation process into stars. When stars explode or they put a bunch of energy and momentum back out into the galaxy, it goes into the interstellar medium. The rest of the stars, they don't care if another star near them blows up. They're tiny little dense objects and they sit there saying, yoo-hoo, I'm self-gravitating, I don't care about your shock waves. It's the interstellar medium that gets beaten up by those shocks, by the uh, radiation and the winds from these other stars. They're the th uh, that's the thing that matters. And so it, in some sense, it's not quite the canary in the coal mine, but it is this bellwether for all the stellar physics and the energy transfer and the matter flows that are happening in the galaxy. Stars, it turns out, are pretty boring in the context of galaxies, and all of the action is actually happening in the interstellar medium. So we're going to learn a little bit about how to study the ISM and then how the changing properties of the ISM regulate galaxy evolution. And that's kind of uh, a story that we'll come back to over the next uh, seven weeks of this course. And we'll get at this by looking at three specific case studies that I've chosen to kind of highlight different physical uh, mechanisms that are happening within the ISM. Again, I'll stress that these are kind of spherical cow approximations, uh, where which just means that we're, you know, kind of, you know, sweeping a lot of these effects like the dynamic nature under the rug. Uh, but they do sort of show off the relevant physics and the things we have to think about when we go to do the full-scale numerical simulations like you see here. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that we'll have to care about in implementing when we do numerical simulations. So to get started, I want to talk about the photoionization region, also known as the H2 region, where the H2 refers to ionized hydrogen. So that's up here at that high or high I thing uh, is H, Roman numeral two, which is spectroscopic notation, which indicates singly ionized hydrogen. Uh, spectroscopic notation is essentially the ionization state is one less than the Roman numeral. So helium-3 would be twice ionized helium. Uh, carbon-4 would be uh, three times ionized carbon, etc. And so we'll see uh, H2, just, that just means ionized hydrogen. So it's a plasma. And what happens in these H2 regions is you have a star at the center, which is putting out a copious amount of photoionizing radiation. So it has to be a young, high mass star, because these are the things with high surface temperatures and therefore are putting out a lot of photons with energies greater than 13.6 electron volts, which is the ionization potential of hydrogen. You may recall a traumatic homework problem that had to do with calculating the number of photons. Now is when we care about that physics. So what's happening in H2 regions is you have a scenario like this, which is, this is NGC 604 in the nearby galaxy M33, the best galaxy. And uh, these little high mass stars that you see here in this Hubble image are billowing out this huge amounts of ultraviolet radiation, which is going into the gas around them and ionizing it. So it's surrounded by neutral hydrogen and those photons come in, they find a neutral hydrogen, they kick off the electron and they make a plasma. And so what happens is that you are generating free protons and electrons, but then the reverse process also is happening. So a gas of protons and electrons will come by and an electron will sort of see a proton and it'll say, hey, let's, let's uh, get together. Uh, they connect. They recombine is the word that we use in uh, uh, astrophysics. We say this is a process of recombination. It's the opposite of photoionization. And when they recombine, it leads to a neutral hydrogen atom 
plus the release of a photon. And I'll generally use gamma to indicate the presence of a photon in a reaction. It does not mean it's a gamma ray. It just means it's a photon. So this is the equilibrium scenario here. And we want to use our understanding of the hydrogen atom and the physics of recombination to kind of understand how m these stars, how much of the interstellar medium can one of these stars ionize. Now, uh, to get at this, I want to do a quick, what I think is a refresher on the spectroscopy of the hydrogen atom and the sort of under the Bohr model. And uh, the Bohr model gives us that the energy levels of the uh, hydrogen atom in physics uh, reference is 13.6 electron volts, that's the ionization energy, divided by n squared with a negative because we are below, you know, zero is the unbound state, so negative means we are below, uh, uh, below the binding energy, so we are a bound system. And uh, n is the principal quantum number of the hydrogen atom. If you took physics 271, you know there's a lot of other quantum numbers running around. We're only going to worry about n. And so in terms of this equation for the, uh, the um, energy level, the... Uh, uh, energies of these levels are come out here, it's 13.6 minus 3.4 minus 1.5, and as n gets progressively larger and larger, that number asymptotically rolls up and it approaches uh, zero. So as n goes to infinity, it goes to zero. So those high n levels, n of 100 or whatever, are incredibly like whisper thin binding uh, of the electron to the proton. A good sneeze will knock that electron off. Well, on an atomic scale, a sneeze is probably enough to ionize a lot of hydrogen atoms, but be that as it may. Um, the other thing that we want to sort of dredge into our memory and recall is, uh, is something that, you know, flavors astronomical convention intensely, is that when we see electronic transitions of the hydrogen atom, that goes from one bound state to another bound state. So if we drop down from one bound state like the n equals 6 state down to the n equals 2 state, that electronic transition that you see there will release a photon, and that photon will have a specific wavelength slash frequency corresponding to the energy difference between those atomic levels. And in physics, or in astrophysics in particular, we love to tag these with the names of the series that they belong to. And the series is defined by the energy level where the electron ends up. The Lyman series is the series that ends up with n equals 1. Uh, the Balmer series ends in n equals 2. The Passion series ends in n equals 3. And then, because we want even more in the way of convention, uh, we tend to label the transitions in the series with the Greek letters. So the uh, Lyman alpha is the 2 to 1 transition. Uh, H alpha or Balmer alpha is the three to two transition. So it's just the first transition in each series. And then the later transitions are uh, called beta, gamma, delta. And eventually you get tired of saying Greek letters. So then you just say the number of the top level, like H11 would be the N equals 11 to N equals two transition of the hydrogen uh, atom, which would be a part of the Balmer series. So the Greek letter tells you the top level, the uh, name of the series tells you the bottom level. And for the Balmer series, because it's the, uh, the optical signature we see, it's those show up in the optical portion of the spectrum, we just call them H, cause H is hydrogen. So that should be at least, you know, vaguely rec uh, a vague recollection here. We're going to sort of very fluidly refer to things in these first few series and sort of discuss them uh, without going into the actual quantum numbers so that you can, you know, you'll eventually become a little fluent in just being like, oh, Lyman gamma, that is n equals uh, four to one. Done. Okay. Uh, any questions on that so far? Well, in that case, hmm, let's not do 
Uh, I've got questions for you. Which is, what is the wavelength of a photon that's emitted in the n equals 4 to n equals 2 transition of the hydrogen atom? All right, looks like we're coming in. Oop, ah, hmm. Unmute, it's amazing. Okay, uh, looks like we're coming in on some answers. So let's sort of set this up. Uh, let's set this up with a pen instead. So we have the energy of a photon is the change in energy uh, between the initial and the final states. So that's the final minus the initial is minus 13.6 EV times 1 over n final squared uh, minus 1 over n initial squared. And this gives you minus 13.6 EV times 1 over n final is 2 squared minus 1 over n initial is 4 squared. And if you get that, that is 3 sixteenths. And plugging this in gives you minus 2.55 EV. Now you may be curious about the sign on that. You say, oh, it's negative. Why is that weird? So this is the energy change for the electron that dropped down. The photon is what gets that energy. So it goes out and it carries a positive energy of the same magnitude. So then if we want to calculate this, I gave you the cheater's formula, which is that h times c in incredibly useful units is 1240 eV nanometers. You can put in 6.63 times 34 times uh, 3 times 10 to the 8, and then you can convert that into eV uh, and get the uh, same result. But if you do the cheater's formula, which I'm a big fan, I, I like the cheater's formula, is 1240 uh, eV dot nanometers over uh, the 2.55 EV, that is distinctly uh, not the right variable on the other side, that's a lambda over there. And if I plug that in, I get 486.2 nanometers. Okay, let's see how we did. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So we got a lot of 486s. I like 486s running around here. Okay, so smack dab in the middle of the optical spectrum. This is a moderately blue line uh, here. And so uh, just real quick, um, 
going back to this. I haven't made a slide for this, but I want you to go ahead and answer what is the n equals 5 to n equals 3 transition called? All right, we're getting some convergence here. I like the convergence. Uh, so the key to naming the transitions is to look at where it ends up. Uh, where it ends up is the n equals three. So n equals three tells you the series. n equals three, that tells you this is the passion series. The first line would be alpha. So n equals four to three, that would be passion alpha. Passion alpha, so n equals 5 to 3 would be passion beta, which is the answer that pretty much everybody has converged to. All right, uh, very good. So, uh, just, you know, I warn you, though, be fluid. If you have a question as to which transition that is, just give me the shout out. I'll handle that. Okay. Uh, next is thinking a little bit further about what photoionization actually means. Uh, let's imagine what happens if we have a hydrogen atom uh, sitting here very happily uh, going around with a proton and a uh, electron uh, and then along comes a photon with energy of 20 electron volts and it hits this uh, atom and the effect is that I end up with my proton and then I have my electron flying off with some speed v uh, out of that. The photon's gone, it got uh, photo absorbed. What I want to know is how fast will that electron be traveling after this ionization? Uh, you're going to, I realize I need to give you a couple additional uh, pieces of information. Um, you may know them, but I should remind you that one electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And yeah, it's unlikely but possible that you might need to know that the kinetic energy of an object is one half mv squared. Yeah. You might need to know that.
All right, so we're coming to convergence here. I think uh, this is a conservation of energy problem. We have the energy running around in the photon. Uh, that energy gets dumped into the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom. I'll indicate that as E naught plus the kinetic energy of the electron coming out. I need to solve for the kinetic energy. So K is equal to 1 half mv squared is equal to the energy of the photon minus energy of the binding energy of the hydrogen atom. Then I can solve for V and that is equal to two times the difference in energies over M all square root, and then I plug in 2, and then we do 20 EV minus 13.6 EV times, got to convert here, no cheater constant, and the reason for that is that I want an answer in meters per second, so EV per joule, so let's take it to good old SI units, for which case I can do 9.11 times 10 to the minus uh, 31 kilograms, if you know rest mass energy and you gave me as a fraction of the speed of light, you're awesome. But it's not what we were looking for today. Uh, stick all that in, we get 1.5 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, which is fast, but not really, really relativistically fast. Okay, how do we do? Oh, hey, definitely, definitely got that answer a lot. Oh yeah, a lot. I always appreciate getting 42s in my answer as well. That's, that's good. All right, uh, so this just means to activate that kind of energy. Okay, photons energy, where does it go? How does it interact with uh, electrons and bound systems? Part of your brain once again. So to um, the other thing that I want to sort of note on astronomical convention here is whenever we have these photons coming in here and ionizing atoms, we often say that the, uh, that's definitely an interesting way to spell ionize. What kind of chucklehead did that? Uh, the, um, the, the way we get, the, when we say we ionize, we often say that the electron is ejected into the continuum, which just means it's running around in a continuum of states. And so the photons that do that are often called continuum photons. So the Lyman continuum photons are the photons that have a wavelength greater or less, less than, man, I'm, I am not on fire today. This is the opposite of fire. Uh, less than 91.2 nanometers, and that is the corresponds to the energy of 13.6 electron volts. And then the Balmer continuum photons are uh, those with wavelengths that are shorter than 365 nanometers. And so that turns out to be the energy that you see right up here. That's the minus 3.4 uh, electron volts, so that's where that wavelength comes from. So that's basically saying, if we say, oh, this is a Lyman continuum photon, that's our cool astro way of saying, oh, it just has an energy greater than the uh, binding energy of a hydrogen atom. So what we want to do is use this little physics that we activated here to think about how big of a re uh, region will a uh, star be able to keep ionized? And the model that we use is called the Stromgren sphere after the theorist who kind of wrote down the first principles of uh, the sphere, uh, Stromgren. And what happens here is uh, we have this nice ionizing source here at the center of the Stromgren sphere in the middle of a perfectly uniform medium. So you can tell this is already a lie, but it's a good lie. Uh, and the thing that we want to measure is the size of the Stromgren sphere. Inside, we're going to assume that it's filled mostly with ionized hydrogen with the occasional uh, neutral atom there that comes from the process of recombination. And then we have these ionizing photons coming out from the star that are going out, finding those neutral hydrogen atoms, 
ionizing them. And then the environment we have here is in a time steady state. So what's happening is every photon that goes out gets hit with, a, it hits an atom that has recombined into the neutral state. And then this volume is basically the volume over which the number of photons is able to go find every atom that has recombined and then reionize it. So the model that we're going to do is we're going to calculate the uh, Stromgren sphere radius, Rs. In terms of the properties of the system, we are going to care about the number of ionizing photons per second, the kind of thing that you calculate on a homework if you assume a black body curve. And then we also want to know the number of hydrogen, uh, number density of hydrogen nuclei inside this region. That's uh, all these little red dots here. We're going to assume that's in steady state. I told you that that's the big lie because this thing's going to get hit by shock waves and other fluids come passing through here. We're going to assume it's spherical and uniform. Again, not maybe not great if you recall those uh, simulations. And we're going to further assume that it is pure hydrogen. And that just means that for every proton in the system, you get one electron here. And that just, you know, means that we can simplify our math a little bit. So if, under these assumptions, what we want to do is we essentially say that inside this volume, the number of photons that are produced every second, this Q naught term, is equal to the number of recombinations that occur per unit time everywhere in this volume. So everywhere in here, we have these photons, uh, these uh, protons recombining with electrons to form hydrogen atoms. And then for every time that happens once in this volume, the star produces one photon. It not, you know, may not be a one-to-one -one match, it's gonna travel out, but on equilibrium steady state, they're, all, they're going to be imbalanced. The number of times you get a recombination equals the number of times you produce an ionized photon. And it's basically, if you had more ionizing photons, this region would expand a little bit and you'd go a little farther out and you'd be able to ionize a little bit more. And if you had more recombinations, you'd basically absorb those photons closer to the star and the region would get a little uh, smaller. So what's gonna happen is we're just gonna calculate, well, in this exact balance, this is the size of the region that we uh, get. And so we want to calculate the number of recombinations per unit volume. And this is a two body uh, problem. So what happens is we have an electron and a proton coming together. So the rate at which that happens has to depend on the densities of electrons times the densities of protons, because you basically have to get the two of those things together. So since it's a two body system, we're looking, we always expect to see a product of density squared, but there's something that has to do like the whole atomic physics of recombination and calculating what is the probability that if I have an electron whizzing by a proton at a certain speed, it'll get recaptured by that proton into a bound state. Which bound state will it go into? What will the, you know, uh, what are the probabilities that that happens? And that is all wrapped up into this coefficient here or this rate coefficient called alpha. And alpha is the recombination rate, and you can calculate that out and come up with a heuristic formula that looks like this. Alpha t is just some number, 2.54 times 10 to the minus 9, and that comes from calculating and averaging over all the speeds of the electron distribution, all the possible states that it can go into, uh, the pro uh, quantum mechanical properties of the hydrogen atom and of recombination, and you get that it depends on temperature. And the rough reason for that dependence is if, thing, if the gas is hotter, the electrons are moving with respect to the protons faster, and since they have less time that they are spending nearby for that quantum mechanical process to happen, then the probability of recombination goes down. So that's the main physics behind this exponent being a negative number. The no reason why it's minus 8. Uh, 0.8163, and I've even dropped off a uh, second order uh, coefficient uh, trailing uh, term on this is that uh, that that's in the gore of uh, the actual derivation itself but this gives us a scaling that we can work with so I want to mostly focus on these units meter cubed 
per second squared. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this coefficient here times one power of density, that has a per meter cubed, and then times another power of density, and that's another per meter cubed. So this product up here is going to have units of per meter cubed per second. And so what that means is that this is the number of recombinations that happen in a volume of space per unit time per unit volume. So that uh, given these two densities. And that's what comes out of the um, basically arguing that this is a two-body problem that depends on the protons and the electrons. So then to figure out how many recombinations happen over the entire sphere, we multiply by the volume of that sphere and then multiply it by that recombination rate per unit volume and that gives us the recombinations per second which we set equal to the total number of photons produced solve for the Stromgren radius. And then that gives us this nice expression 3q naught over 4 pi alpha nh squared and that nh squared comes by assuming that NH is equal to NE, and that was the pure hydrogen assumption coming in. And then this one third comes from the fact that it's a sphere. So this gives us a method by saying, well, how large of a volume can I actually keep ionized with this uh, ionizing source? So uh, that's the uh, mechanics of the derivation. Do you have any questions on how that worked out? Typing, no one muting. Well, on and ever on. So I want to know what is the size of a Strongman sphere for a region with a volume density of NH of 10 to the 6 per meter cubed and an ionizing source that produces 10 to the 49 photons per second. This is a high, this is like an O5 star would produce this many photons per second. We'll assume that the temperature is 10,000 Kelvin and I'd like to know your answer in meters. Go wild.
All right, so I've gone ahead and done the setup here. We just stick in Q naught, that's given. The density up here is given, that shows up there. Uh, the temperature is 10 to the fourth Kelvin, so this whole term doesn't enter into it. We just need that coefficient here, uh, which we stick in there. 4 pi is 4 pi, 1 third is 1 third. And if we uh, crunch that out, I got 2.1 times 10 to the 18 meters. That's big. How big is it? Well, uh, I find it's useful to convert into parsec. So one parsec is equal to 3.086 times 10 to the 16 meters. And that comes out to be about 70 parsecs. Uh, you don't necessarily, you know, this is distant to a reasonably, you know, a, one of a nearby stars, you know, not the closest, but near a star, or it's about the thickness of the disk of the galaxy. So I find that will be useful uh, benchmark for looking at later. So these are pretty big regions here, and you can see how a few stars would carve out a large chunk of the interstellar medium with this ionized region. Uh, any questions on that execution? Okay, so I wanted to do a quick example here to sort of show another way that we can use this recombination coefficient, which is to basically say, well, what is the time scale? I said that these things aren't in, time, uh, in steady state, so how long does it take for it to turn off and turn on? And we know that the main sequence lifetime for a star like this is going to be about 3 million years. So it's, you know, high mass star, short, short lifetime. Is the sort of turn on, turn off time for an H2 region going to be longer or shorter than that so that our assumption of steady state was reasonable? So I'm going to take this by saying, well, what happens if this uh, source suddenly shuts off? How long would it take for this region to recombine into neutral hydrogen? And this is an estimate. And so the way I'm going to execute that estimate is by saying, well, the time scale for this is going to be the density of the ionized gas. I'm going to then divide it by the density of the recombinations. So the way I've set this up, this is recombinations per volume per time. And then this is just particles per volume. So you can see that uh, this will give me an answer in time. Uh, the analogy that we have here is I kind of think about, you know, it's traveling, you know, if we think about this in literally grade eight math, this is distance equals rate times time uh, or rate times time. Let's call it velocity. We're, we're, we're enough far along in physics that we don't need to call it rate. Uh, distance equals uh, v times time. So time is just the distance it has to travel over the speed. This is basically an analogous argument. It's not going to take into account the fact that you're speeding up or slowing down or anything like this. It's a very coarse level of argument uh, here. Uh, but what we have is we can just stick this in and see that the recombination rate is nh over alpha times nh squared. I'm going to assume that's 10 to the fourth Kelvin again. I'm going to cancel out one of those powers and I get 1 over alpha times nh and that's equal to uh, 1 over 2.54 times 10 to the minus 19 meter cubed per second times my density which is 10 to the 6 per meter cubed. You notice the meter cubes cancel out as promised, and so then this ends up as 1 over 2.4 times 10 to the negative 13, and then that gives me 3.9 times 10 to the 12 seconds, which if I remember that one year is pi times 10 to the 7 seconds, or 3.16, depending on how precise you want to be, this comes out at about 1.2 times 10 to the 5 years, which is good. It's shorter 
than the time scale for evolution, shorter than three mega years. So maybe we can get away with saying that this region isn't uh, destroying or eroding uh, the H2 region while the star is evolving substantially. This is relatively short, so it's telling us that this kind of recombination time is short compared to the main sequence lifetime of the star. All right. That gets us to the end of photoionization regions. We'll come and engage in deep contemplation of what this means next Monday, and then we'll do a little bit of studies on extinction and dust process reprocessing uh, on Friday, working with our uh, Gaia data to show that the interstellar medium is there as well. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.